morning, everybody, and welcome back to Physics 5429. This week, the aim is to try to wrap up this discussion about neural networks and the basic mathematics in connection also with the automatic differentiation, which leads to uh, the famous algorithm, which we call backpropagation, which, as we discussed last time and anticipated for today's discussion, is nothing but the reverse mode of automatic differentiation. And one of the main reasons we use the so-called reverse mode by starting with the derivatives at the end, which means the output value, as we will also see today through some of the uh, examples. Uh, the reason for that is that we have uh, less variables at the end of a neural network. The, typically, the output consists of some few output variables, and which means that uh, when we are setting up the uh, dimensionalities for calculating the derivatives and going backwards in the network in order to train the parameters, we normally start with uh, less variables than we would have if we start at the input layer, where we typically can have thousands of input values. If you have an image with 100 times 100 pixels multiplied with three color channels, then we end up with 30,000 the input nodes for just one image. Now, after we've done this, and one of the reasons why we are going to put some emphasis on these uh, mathematical properties is simply because the back propagation algorithm enters all the algorithms which we will meet in a short time. And the first one which we will meet is convolution neural networks. And if we get time, we will start scratching the surface of that today. And uh, we will continue with that next week and the week thereafter. And after that, we will discuss recurrent neural networks. And before the Easter break, we will hopefully also have uh, covered autoencoders, which then normally consists of uh, different uh, uh, types of neural networks or convolution neural networks or even recurrent neural networks. So the uh, books, which we also have been mentioning earlier, there are two recent texts which you can actually download. Uh, one is on uh, archive, and you can download the full book. It's uh, roughly 600 pages. And there's a shorter one which also has been published in Cambridge. And if you are on a University of Oslo uh, IP address, you can download it for free if you just log in to the university library. Also, the textbooks which we are using, uh, as a quick reminder, uh, are the textbook by Sebastian Raschka, which uh, contains uh, uh, Jupyter notebooks, if you go to the GitHub address, uh, with the uh, PyTorch examples, which many of you prefer as a programming environment. And then there's David Foster's and Bali and Gavra's textbooks, which then contain, again, Jupyter notebooks, if you go to the respective GitHub sites, and then you can download uh, all the Jupyter notebooks. And there the emphasis on Tensor, on the applications using TensorFlow. Then the other book which we follow is uh, Goodfellow, Benjo's and Co. Will's text. Uh, Benjo was, by the way, the recipient of the uh, Turing Medal, which is uh, the closest you get to a Nobel Prize in computer science and data science. And uh, the uh, textbook, uh, the deep learning textbook can also be accessed for free. And the uh, neural network part is covered in the Goodfellow part book is in chapter six and seven. And then for convolution neural network, we have chapter nine. And Rashka has a, a, a very good description of uh, convolution neural networks. And there we will discuss the mathematics of CNNs next week in more detail. There are some videos which you can look up. And what I wanted to remind you quickly about is the example which we looked at last week. So last week, we used the part of the session to discuss automatic differentiation and how we implement the chain rule and can break down a set of calculations in terms of elementary functions. And these elementary functions, if we can break up the calculation in terms of elementary functions, then we can use what's normally called automatic differentiation, which is essentially us setting up a series of uh, derivatives using the chain rule. So what I wanted to quickly remind you about is the simple example which we ended up with uh, last week and which will also allow us to connect with the mathematics of a full 
pleural network. So we are starting with what's normally called a simple perceptron model. And this will also allow us to illustrate some of the basic mathematical quantities which we are going to need. So I will just break down the pace a little bit by jumping again a little bit back and forth between the whiteboard and the slides here. In the slides here, or the Jupyter Notebook, which you're watching now, we also have some simple program examples which implement the backpropagation algorithm. But let's uh, slow down the pace a little bit and remind ourselves quickly about what we did last week. So the first example which we looked at is what we call a simple perceptron model. And this is inspired by the neural science. And we can now think of, if we do this graphically, this is an example which we looked at, we have a, an input x. So the circles represent variables, input variables or output variables. And the squares here represent mathematical operations. And we will typically feed this in into a function, which we call an activation function. And this is, a, again, a big debate in the field. And I'm going to call this for a sigma 1. So this is a mathematical function. This receives also an input, which is called a bias, a B1. And then there is a weight factor. So we are modulating the input in a specific way. So the way we are modulating it. So this should be a C1. So this variable C1, which we will generalize to uh, uh, matrices times vectors a little bit later, or matrices times vectors, or matrices. This is given by this parameter W1 multiplied with X plus this B1. Now the input to this function is modulated in one or another way, and it produces an output, which in this case we are going to call an A1. And this output is then fed into a new function. Now we're gonna put in some more labels here. So this is the output. And in this case, there is no hidden layer. So this will be the input layer. This is our output layer. And here we have the so-called activation function. This is the sigma one. And then in here we have, uh, so we label this with red, red boxes. This is where we perform mathematical operations. And then we have a new function here, which is now the cost function. And this cost function is a function of the input variables. It's a function of the target values, y. So in here, we are feeding in the target values, y. So this is the output of some specific function. And we could have a function y of x, which could be given by, let's say, 2x plus 1, just to give you a Martin. simple example. Martin? Yeah, are you, go ahead. Are you sharing your screen? Yeah, I should be sharing the screen. Can, can't you see it? Mm, I can see. If you're drawing, I can see it. So I'm, I'm drawing here. It says that I'm sharing. Is Can everybody see the... Yeah, I see that the yeah, I can see the screen same. as well. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's strange. Okay. Now because it's, it's highlighted with green, so it seems that the other ones are seeing the screen. Okay, that's strange. Okay, let let, let me just continue here. Well, if if you are on the Mac, maybe you could just uh Flip your icons so you're certain that you're active on the, the Zoom icon. Yeah, it should be on the Zoom icon, but you can, you can because see it might the, be you, you just see the yeah the icons on your right hand side in the menu. Hmm. But the, it seems that the other people can actually see my whiteboard and what I'm writing on the whiteboard. So this is strange. Okay. I don't know what to do with that, but let me let me just set up because everything is also in the uh, in the uh, Jupyter notebook what I'm putting up now. Okay. So the uh, uh, this function uh, C 
is a function also of these variables, W1 and B, and these are the variables which we want to optimize. So this is something which we then can write uh, in terms of uh, a graph, as you can see here, and the squares they represent mathematical operations. So we can actually break down everything which we have in terms of different mathematical operations here. Now, with that, we can now optimize. And when we optimize, it means that we want to calculate the derivatives of this function C with respect to the unknown parameters W1 and B. So these are the parameters which we now want to optimize. So what we need to set up then, when we are going to perform the optimization, then since we only have one uh, layer, which is the output layer, we are going to define, in this specific case, a cost function, which is given by one half. So we have only one input variable, one output variable. So we're just dealing with scalars. There are no vectors here. And then we have y squared. And uh, this is, again, nothing but one half multiplied with this uh, sigma one of C1 minus Y here, square. And uh, what we are going to need then when we are setting up the derivatives are the derivatives of this quantity C, which is normally called the cost function or the loss function, with respect to W1. And when we look at the function here, what we actually have, when you look at this one, this is nothing but this unknown variable, which we want to tune, times x plus the variable b1. And when we then use the chain rule, as we did last time, we start with a derivative with respect to this variable a1, which then is a function of z1, which again is a function of uh, w1. So this is the way we break it down using the chain rule. And everything is much simpler when we are using a scalar set of variables. Later, we will simply uh, make this more general in terms of uh, different matrices and vectors. But now we are just uh, thinking of a very simple system where we send in an input and we receive an output. And then we want to fit a function, which is now given by, in principle, by a function a1, which we are idealizing as a w1 times x plus b1. So this is the output of the network. And we also labeled this earlier as a y tilde. So this is going to be the output when we do a regression problem. So in our case, this is a function of sigma 1. But in our case, we are going to put it equal to the value itself. And if you think of the function which we want to fit, this is y of x. This is something which uh, we have a uh, y, sorry. So y of x is now given by this simple linear function. And uh, when we do a regression type of problem, we normally let the activation function just be given by the input to that specific node itself. So the, which means that uh, when we deal with a regression problem, we normally do not modulate the output. We simply put the output equal to the input to the final output node. So if you go back here, it means that uh, when we have a regression problem, the standard way of setting up this activation function is simply to let A1 be equal to the input to the final output node C1. We are going to repeat this with a hidden layer, but still with the scalar variables. And when we set up now all these derivatives, you see now that when we use this function C, it's rather easy to convince ourselves that the first derivative, this DC of DW1, is nothing but, if we take the derivative of the cost function with respect to A1, this is the same as A1, minus y. And then, uh, since now the uh, activation function is just producing the input as an output, we see then that this derivative which we have here, this one, is simply equal to uh, 
1 because a1 is now equal to c1. So this means that this function here is just equal to c1. So dA1 of dc1 is just 1. And then we are left with a function dc1 of dW to 1. And when we take the derivative of that quantity, we see that that is just given by x. So this is, in our case, a pretty simple equation. Now, one thing which we will do in the codes is to relabel this quantity, which you have here, which is the same as the derivative of the cost function multiplied with the derivative of the activation function. We are going to relabel that quantity as a delta 1. And uh, we will use that uh, later in also the calculation with uh, more complicated systems. You will uh, see that the introduction of this parameter delta is going to play an important role when we are setting up the calculations of different derivatives using the chain rule. Now, the other quantity which we need to set up is the derivative with respect to uh, B1, which is the other unknown quantity. So this is simply given by, again, dc of dA1 of dA1 of dC1. And this is, again, given by this quantity delta 1 multiplied with uh, dC1 of dB1. And then we just remember now that C1 is simply equal to W1 times X plus B1. And so we see that this last derivative is just equal to one. So pay attention to these equations which we have here because you will see this pattern being repeated again and again. So here we have now the derivative in of delta C of the function C with respect to the output, which is actually the quantity which it depends explicitly on. And since uh, A1 depends implicitly on all the other parameters, we simply have to use a the chain rule in a repeated way. So this is again DC1 of DW1. And this is the quantity which we will label as a delta 1 here. And then in this specific case, this is actually equal to delta one multiplied with X, which is the input variable. And then we had delta C of delta B one, which is now simply equal to delta one. Now with these parameters, we can actually now set up a program where we're going to run the training. So if you've gotten the basics here, and many of you have already written a neural network code, and I hope you can forgive me for repeating many of these things, but this is a good way to remind yourself of what you did when you wrote the neural network code. So what you end up with then, when we now are implementing a gradient descent algorithm, so the training itself now is going to be given by us updating the gradients. So we are gonna call this the training of the gradients because now we have the expressions for the derivatives. So that means that uh, this parameter W1 will be updated by the previous value minus, and then we have a parameter which we call for the learning rate, eta. And this is given by the derivative, which is now delta one times X. So this is the derivative of DC dW1 here. And similarly, we have the unknown parameter B1, which is simply B1 minus eta times delta one here. And this is the derivative of the cost function with respect to the parameter B1. And later, we are going to see how we can extend this to a more complex system, a system with a one hidden layer. So the next example, which we will look at before we now go back to the codes, the next example is one with a one hidden layer. And with one hidden layer, what we have is now a variable X again. This is fed into a new activation function, which we will again call for sigma one here. And that takes an input C1. So all the variables are still scalars. And then we have a unknown parameter B1 here, 
So we have a V1 and a W1 as the parameters. This function produces now a, an output, A1. This output is then fed into a new activation function, which is now our output layer. So the function here defines the hidden layer. And I'm gonna remark this uh, operations here in terms of uh, red boxes. So I have a new activation function, sigma two, and this takes an input of Z two. There is a new bias variable, B two here. And then I have a new weight parameter, W two. And this feeds in to the output function, A two, and then this is sent into the activation function or the cost function. And finally, I have a Y here, which is my target value I want to reproduce. So this uh, last layer, which you see here, this one here, that defines now my output layer. And again, I have the cost function here. So this is my cost function. And this is the function which I want to calculate the derivative of. So in this case, again, what we are going to need then are the derivatives with respect to the parameters W1. We're going to need a derivative with respect to the parameters W2. We're going to need the derivatives of B1. And finally, of DC of B2. So these are now the four parameters which we need to train. Then after we've gone through this example here and looked at the codes, et cetera, we are going then to uh, generalize this to a general neural network with many input layers, uh, sorry, many input nodes and uh, one or more hidden layers. And each hidden layer can have more than one input node. And then finally, there is an output layer. So we, if we now stay with this simple example, which we had previously, then we can uh, uh, easily see uh, how to set up these derivatives. And this quantity DC of DW2 here is just going to now be given by this delta of two multiplied now with A1 as an input parameter. This is going to be the same as DC of DA2 of D A two of D C two. And finally, this is multiplied with a partial derivative with respect to the parameter W two. And to quickly remind you of uh, the variables. So this parameter Z two, which we have here is now simply going to be given by W two times A one plus B two. And here again, we have a Z1, which is nothing but W1, the unknown parameters multiplied with the input variable plus a B1 here. Now, one thing which we can actually do when we practice here is to show that if we have a uh, function which is non-linear in X, we can actually with one hidden layer, we are able to reproduce using the universal approximation theorem a nonlinear dependence on X with at least one hidden layer. Uh, the universal approximation theorem doesn't say anything about the structure of the hidden layer, how many nodes we need, uh, what type of activation functions we are using, et cetera, et cetera. But it simply says that we can now approximate a given function to a given precision with at least one hidden layer. And uh, the first case which we had, which is this perceptron model, you saw then from the simple function which we're feeding in that that perceptron model is able to uh, mimic a, a linear function in X. If we have a nonlinear function X, then you can quickly see from the mathematics of the previous case that we will not be able to, with just one output layer, to represent a function which is nonlinear in the input variable X. So hopefully these two simple examples also tell you or allow you to develop an intuition why a neural network with at least one hidden layer
is capable of setting up uh, an approximation to a function which is nonlinear in x. If it's a function which is linear in x, as you saw from the first example, we can then, with a neural network tailored to a regression type of problem, where the output is simply the input to the output node, then we can have a simple linear dependence in terms of the parameters w1 and b1, the bias, which then plays the role of the intercept of a linear function in x. And you can see that if you simply go back to what we put up here. So we have a, an output when we are using a regression type of problem, which is simply given by w1 and b1. So when we then train the network, and we train the network so that we drive these derivatives to zero, then training the network is going to give us optimal parameters w1 and b1. And hopefully this w1 is going to be pretty close to two here. And this b1 is going to be pretty close to one. So this is the case when we have just one uh, layer, which is the output layer. When we have a more complex function like uh, a second order polynomial in X, then we will need a neural network with at least one hidden layer according to the universal approximation theorem. Now, what you see from a practical point of view and what we need to program is that we have chains of derivatives. When we can break down everything in terms of a computational graph and elementary functions, like the cost function is assumed to be an elementary function whose derivatives are easy to calculate. Similarly, the activation functions are normally expected to be simple mathematical functions like the sigmoid or these ARELO functions or the ELO functions or all these other types of functions, which normally have analytical expressions for the derivatives even. <laughs> so in the, in the first examples of programs, I'm going through this in a more brute force way where I'm setting up uh, the derivatives by hand, but later we can change this with automatic differentiation and JAX, which is now the standard library, which has inherited the automatic differentiation project, project in Python programming. So if you then look back at the network here, we have a way to express the derivatives of the output variables. And then we have to trace ourselves back and find the derivatives of W1 with respect to the cost function which we have. So that means that the derivative which we have for W1 needs simply now to be expressed in terms of a chain of uh, partial derivatives. So let's just set up the equation for one of them and then you will see easily the pattern. So W2 and B2 are going to be the same as we had in the previous example, but we have to be a little bit more careful with the uh, the derivatives of the hidden layer. So again, now we are going to look after W1. Now this has a more complicated uh, dependency, which uh, again means that we now need to set up the chain rule in terms of uh, the different variables. So we would have a DC in terms of the explicit variables of the output layer. So this is an A2 here. And then we have a DA2, and now we have a D, of, of C2, so sorry, uh, oops. This quantity which you see here is nothing but the derivative of the activation function at the output node. And if we are dealing with a, a regression type of problem, then this output is actually equal to the input. If you're dealing with a classification problem, then we need to set up a function which mimics a probability. And often what people would use then, if you have just two types of outputs, either true or false, then you would set up the sigmoid function. If you have a classification problem with more than two classes as output, then you would typically use a function which is called a softmax function, which we will come back to. But for a type of regression problem, like the one we are looking at now, then these uh, uh, derivatives are very simple to evaluate because the 
input to the output layer is going to be the same as the output. So C2 is equal to A2. And then we are now tracing ourselves back. So we have the derivative with C2, but previously we had W1 here. But now we need to break this down in terms of a new derivative. We need a DC1, and then we have a DC1 here with respect to W1. Now, this derivative of uh, DC, uh, of DC2 and DC1 is a function which we can manipulate further. But if we now look back here, we have first this delta two here. So this defines that quantity, which we previously called delta one. And now we need to look a little bit closer at the C2 with respect to C1. So the pattern which you're seeing now is something which will uh, uh, pop up again and again, also in more complicated expressions. So let's quickly remind ourselves. So C2 here is simply given by a parameter W2 multiplied with uh, the input from the hidden layer, but sorry, the output from the hidden layer plus this parameter B2. Now this is nothing but W2 multiplied with sigma one of C1 plus B2, which again is the same as W2 and then I have a C1, and this contains now W1 of X plus a B1 plus B2 here. <clears throat> so now you see that we have a, an explicit dependence on uh, uh, C1 and a relation between C1 and C2. We see also that DC1 with respect to W1, since this quantity here is actually equal to C1, this is nothing but X. So we need now to break down DC2 in terms of uh, A1. So we can then take DC2 of DC1. We would now rewrite that one as DC2 of DA1. And then I have a DA1 of DC1 here. So with that operation, then we are now able to set up uh, the final derivatives. And I see that DC2 with respect to A1, if we now look back at the expression here, we see now that uh, this one is given by this term. So that means that what I get now is a W2 here, that is this term. And DA1 of DC1 is nothing but the derivative of the cost function for the No, sorry, the derivative of the activation function for the hidden layer. So this quantity, which you see here, is nothing but sigma one derivative. So we can then collect everything here. And uh, we see then that the DC of DW1 is going to be given by this quantity delta one. So sorry, delta two. So if we go back, so we have delta two here. So this is this term. And then we need now to break down uh, DC two with respect to DC one and these quantities, which you see here. And that gives us W two, the derivative of this function and multiplied with X. So what we have next is the derivative of the next activation function. And then we have uh, the parameter w2 and finally we have the parameter x and the way you would see this written is now in terms of a new variable which is given by delta one it's pretty straightforward to see that dc of v1 is simply going to be given by this parameter delta one so the reason why i'm going a little bit through this in a meticulous in a meticulous way is that I want you to see the kind of pattern which you will, which we will generalize uh, pretty soon. So the uh, these parameters delta one is going to be given by the previous value. It's going to contain the derivative of the uh, activation function on that specific layer, and then it's going to contain uh, the weight which we have here multiplied with the output input variable x. 
Now, in the program, I'm going to label this one as an A0. So when you see the zero, and when we make this more general, this will actually be written as an A with a superscript zero, just to indicate that the output layer is labeled as layer zero. The first hidden layer is labeled as layer one. And then the final layer is going to be given by an uppercase letter L in our definitions, of, in which are going to come pretty soon. So what you see now is a certain pattern which emerges, which allows us to set up the derivatives we want to train. So we would have an update of the parameter W2, which is given by the previous value. And in the example code, which we have in the Jupyter notebook, we are simply going to use the same learning rate. And for those of you who have taken a course in machine learning already, you know that there are many recipes by which we can improve the uh, setup of the learning rate from just a plain constant variable, which you will find in the two examples, which we have in the Jupyter notebook, two more uh, advanced updates, which include information about the gradients. So in this specific case, what we have then is a delta two here for the output layer. And this is then multiplied with the input from the previous layer, A1. Sorry, I think I, yeah, put called delta two. And then I had a B2 here, which is simply given by B2 minus eta times this variable delta two. Then I have W1, which is then given by the previous value minus this uh, learning rate eta multiplied with delta one. And this is now multiplied with uh, the input variable, which we call for X, but which we are just going to generalize on A0 here. And later when we are going to look at the many input variables and many hidden nodes, we will need both superscripts and subscripts to distinguish the different variables. I hope this doesn't create too much confusion. And then we have a B1 here, which is given by a delta one. Now, these are the uh, four equations, which then make up the back propagation part. So every iteration which we have, we are going to have a feed forward part where we find the output variable, and then we plug this in to the back propagation algorithm. We find all the derivatives, and with all the derivatives, we can update the different parameters, W2, B2, W1, and B1. So I just wanted to have you with me with this simple example, because if you see these, uh, the general patterns which emerge here, you see then that when we are going to generalize this to many input nodes and many hidden nodes and several hidden layers, the basic structure is going to contain a parameter uh, delta one here for the hidden layer, which will contain information about previous layers. In our case here, this is the output layer, multiplied with the derivatives of the activation function in that specific layer. And then we have the weight parameter in the previous layer. And this is again multiplied with the parameter for, from the uh, layer before the specific layer we are looking at. In our case, this is just the input layer. Any questions so far? So this is, uh, I just wanted to go through this in a more pedantic way. And uh, uh, to those of you who have seen many of these things before, please have me excused. But one of the things which is important for us is the fact that if you look at these expressions, they're going to contain derivatives of the cost function because delta two is a variable now which contains the derivative of the activation function at the output layer. So we have one derivative of the activation function, and then we have a new derivative of the activation function. This pattern will repeat itself when you now have a deeper and deeper network. So with more hidden layers, you will just have chains of derivatives, which will contain just the derivatives of the activation functions. And uh, clearly having the possibility to calculate this in a reliable way and fast way is very important. This is why we often look after activation functions which have analytical expressions. Uh, 
because then the derivatives are easy to calculate. So we are back to one of the central elements of the uh, automatic differentiation algorithm, which simply allows us to calculate derivatives to numerical precision if we can set up a computational graph where we can break down every operation in terms of elementary functions. Now, these elementary functions can also be a program, but a program which uh, allows us to calculate the derivatives. So you see the uh, uh, link here between uh, the back propagation algorithm, the way we train a network, and the reverse mode algorithm for automatic differentiation, which is nothing but us implementing the chain rule repeatedly. So this pattern which you see here and this general setup is something which we, after the break, we are going to generalize in terms of uh, several input nodes, several hidden layers, etc. But the basic structure which you see is going to be the same. And this basic structure, if you look at this specific derivative here or that one, will then contain expressions like those which you see here. This is the way we propagate ourselves backwards and calculate the derivative starting with a, an explicit dependence of the variable which we know, A2. That's what we have in the output layer. And the input and the output layers, these are the layers which uh, allow us to see the results. We have an input, which we know, and we have an output, which we produce. And then we need simply to trace ourselves back and set up the different partial derivatives using the chain rule. And this quantity, which you see here, has a further dependence, as you can see here, on A1 and W2 and B2. So when we are setting up these derivatives, then we need to break this down in terms of uh, the quantities which you see here. And this is something which we are going to generalize after the break. OK, so what I'm going to do now is to go back to some simple examples and just uh, set them up. And these are the examples which we will uh, discuss after the break before we then move into a more complicated code. So you will see much of the same thing here. The equations which I put up on the whiteboard, they are the same as you see here on, on the Jupyter Notebook. And this is the program which we will discuss after the break. And you will see that the program contains a feed forward stage and there's a back propagation stage. And uh, the back propagation stage simply calls the feed forward stage every time. Uh, then there is a uh, calculation of the different derivatives. Uh, we initialize the input variable and we have the target value. This is the simple function which we are setting up. And we are simply having a scalar input. So this X can be generalized to a, a more complicated input where you can have hundreds of variables. And then you define the inputs, the outputs. This is the uh, neural network. And then we define the weights and the biases. We just initialize them with random numbers. And then we are simply calculating the, the various derivatives, as you can see here. And this is something which we will uh, start with after the break. And then we are going to go through the more general uh, case with a hidden layer, but still with scalars. So which are the same expression you saw here? This is the network. And after that, uh, we are going to make life only a slightly bit more complicated. So we are going to have two input nodes, but only two variables, not hundreds of x zeros and x ones. We are going to have one hidden layer with two nodes and the activation function. And then we are going to have an, just one output. And then this feeds into the uh, cost function. And we compare with the uh, target value. We calculate the derivative of that with respect to the output from the network, then propagate back and update all the variables. And in the slides here, you will find all the equations which are needed for this more complicated case. And when you've seen this case, then it's pretty straightforward to generalize to a network with many input variables and many hidden nodes and several hidden layers. But now I'm going to stop the pause the recording. Just to bring back what we said before the break, we have been looking at two very simple examples 
And if we scroll up on the Jupyter Notebook, the simplest one is us breaking down what is called a simple perceptual model with a scalar input. But you could replace that one with a vector which contains hundreds or thousands of input variables. And then you would have hundreds or thousands of output variables. But we have only one output, which is the, in this case, uh, the example which we looked at is the function value. We can uh, make this more and more complicated, but the basic essence, when we now want to optimize the results in terms of these variables, W1 and B1, which are the weights and the biases, and we put the biases normally to a non-zero quantity in order to avoid that uh, we uh, have derivatives, so function values which are zero, if we by accident have a W1 which is zero. And then the function which we take the derivatives with respect to is obviously this uh, cost function, which is a way by which we find the derivatives of the optimal parameters, and is also meant to uh, represent some kind of gauge by which we test the quality of the model which we have. So the neural network is the model. In this case, the model consists of just an output layer and one input node and one output node. And the uh, application of the chain rule gives us then a set of equations, which we discussed before the break, which are pretty straightforward. And uh, in case we have a regression problem where we just want to fit a continuous function, then we end up with uh, a uh, derivative of the activation function, which is just equal to one, because then the output is equal to the input. And this function here is nothing but the derivative of the output with respect to its input. And when C1 is equal to A1, then clearly this derivative is just one. And similarly, we have a simple expression for that one, and we label these parameters for delta one. And then when we want to implement it, there is a feed forward stage. And you can see here, I have a C1, we have X multiplied with the output weights plus the output bias. And this feed forward function simply returns the uh, variable A1, which is equal to C1, since we are dealing with a uh, regression type of problem. If we have a classification problem, then this A1 would be a function of an activation function. Then you see the back propagation stage here where I have the derivative of the cost function, which is just A1 minus Y. And if you go back again to the analytical expressions, you see we have A1 minus Y here. And that defines this uh, quantity delta one, which is just the derivative of the cost function because A1 is equal to Z1 and its derivative is one. Then the uh, output weights have a gradient which is given by delta one times X. And the bias has a similar gradient, which is much simpler. And this function here just returns, uh, after calling the feed forward stage, it just returns the gradients. And in this specific case, you see a very simple network with just one input and one output. Uh, I fix the learning rate to 0 0.101. And then I have a just a, a what you might call a very simple and uh, stupid and not very elegant way of setting up the iterations. So I am performing four iterations. I calculate the derivatives by calling this back propagation, which receives the inputs and the outputs. And I've set up the weights and the biases to some random numbers. This is the way I initialize everything. And then uh, I calculate the uh, output variable, the weights and the biases. These are now updated with the standard gradient descent algorithm with a primitive uh, learning rate. This is something you will have to replace when we now use optimizers like Adam. Uh, we are using optimizers like uh, root mean square propagation or other ones. This is a topic, by the way, which we will not cover in the lectures. So you would have to look that up from uh, the lectures in FIS SDK 4155, or just take a look at the codes which we have here the more general codes. So here, there is just a, what we might call the simplest possible implementation of a gradient descent, which is nothing but a, a Newton's method where we don't calculate the second derivative of the 
gradient no, of the cost function. So the uh, function we want to uh, find the roots of is the gradient. And that means that uh, if we follow Newton's method, there is a uh, derivative of the gradient, which is the second derivative, derivative of the cost function. And this is now replaced by just a parameter. And this is the way which it's normally done in machine learning, because calculating the second derivative of the cost function, if this is a multidimensional function, that becomes a very involved uh, beast to calculate. And we want to avoid that. And that's why we have all these different approximations to updating the learning rate as a function of the number of iterations. So here we are performing 40 iterations. Every iteration consists of a feed forward stage and a back propagation stage. And the back propagation stage is the one where we use the derivatives or the gradients in order to update the weights at each layer of the network. And then uh, what I'm doing now is to assume that my output or my final prediction, which I make, and note well that in this example, since we only have one training point, we are not splitting our data into a train set and a test set. This is something which we will have to do later. So these simple examples which you are seeing are just examples where we uh, make the simplest possible uh, type of training without thinking of having to split the data in training and test. So uh, the reason why you split in train and test is that obviously you don't want to have all the data which you have as training data because then you can easily overfit. And this goes back to what is normally called the bias variance trade-off, which is something which we also will not discuss here. We're assuming that some, most of you are familiar with that. If not, uh, we can always discuss that in the uh, more on a private, in a private basis. So what I do next then is simply to calculate the squared error. And then if we run this function, and this is not a very, how to say, exciting case, you see now that we have uh, the final uh, difference between the value we want to produce, the target value, and the output of our model gives us an, an error, which is 10 to the minus seven. Now these results, they will depend on the learning rate, which we are use. And so the learning rate becomes a parameter. And you see now that changing the learning rate gives me uh, a much, much smaller difference. So you see now that uh, for this linear function, my network is actually doing pretty well. Then uh, there are some exercises here. So feel free to take these examples uh, if you want now to, because when we are going to uh, look at the different codes, uh, you can uh, choose now to write your own code, obviously, or bring back to life the code you've written. You can use the examples we have. If you're not too familiar, since the, we are a pretty heterogeneous group, then it can be useful to actually look back at these examples and try to add functionality. So in this specific example, which you see here, all the inputs and the outputs are, and the weights and the biases are just scalars. So there are no vectors, no matrices, no nothing. So what you could do here is actually try to uh, uh, increase the number of input variables, and you could increase the number of input nodes if you want to do that. So that means that you have to rewrite the function, and then you need to be a little bit more careful with dimensionalities which is what will come up here. Now there's a question of uh, why don't you uh, turn the le learning rate way up if it gets you, if it gives you a better result. Uh, now the, the thing is that in, we don't know what the learning rate is meant to be. So typically if you just start with this kind of brute force approach, which we have here, where we have a fixed learning rate, this parameter eta. The standard approach is to set up a grid of values. And then you would run the calculation with different values. You can see now, if I make it smaller and smaller, that means that uh, you barely move during an iteration. And then you will find uh, an error, which is 0 
which means that since I'm making very, very small steps, I would have to increase the number of iterations here. So I would have to increase it to, let's say, a thousand here. And now you see that uh, I have uh, an error, which is 10 to the minus 15, but the price I had to pay is that I had to ramp it up, ramp up the number of iterations to a thousand. And that uh, becomes very expensive if I have a huge network with many parameters. Now we're just training two parameters, W1 and V1. But what you see is that the, the uh, value of the learning rate is uh, something which is treated as a parameter and you would often just set up a grid of values, let's say 10 to the minus five, 10 to the minus four, because you don't know a priori how many you would need uh, as a function of the number of iterations. The ideal is to have the best possible learning rate with as few iterations as possible. Because at the end, as you will see from the expressions, you end up with a series of affine transformations. That means matrix, matrix, matrix vector transformations of the variables or multiplications. And uh, that is numerically expensive. So I hope that answered uh, the question here, why we don't uh, ramp it up immediately. And that's essentially because we don't know how many iterations we need in order to get the desired result. So 10 to the minus 15 may mean something to some to someone and uh, a totally different thing to somebody else. So what kind of error you're accepting is also something which uh, needs to be discussed. So what we have done here is simply use the neural networks and in being inspired by the universal approximation theorem. So let's see here now, there are more questions. Uh, no, the, uh, exactly. So the, 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 there's a follow-up question. So it's try and iterate and there is no theory to calculate the sweet spot. Now you can have some insights. Uh, the insight, and uh, this is something which I uh, uh, haven't uh, mentioned much now because many of you have actually studied optimization uh, problems and the mathematics of optimizations. Like in many, many cases, the, if the function is a convex function, which uh, we always hope for so that there is a global minima, and uh, then we can actually say something about the derivatives. So this is second derivative, if we can calculate the second derivative of the cost function, which is now the same as this uh, eta function. So if I were to plug in the second derivative here, then this process would converge in just very few iterations. Unfortunately, uh, when I get into a complex problem, I don't know, uh, or it's very complicated, that's better stated, to calculate the second derivative or the cost function, because the cost function can then be a function which depends on millions of parameters. And uh, if we have uh, a thousand uh, parameters to optimize, the second derivative will be a matrix of uh, dimensionality, a thousand times a thousand. And then I am updating thousand parameters, not only two here, but thousand parameters. And I will be doing this many, many times. So clearly calculating the second derivative is something you don't want to. But if you can have insights about the second derivative, that can help you in finding an optimal parameter eta. Now, the methods which you will see implemented in the code below, like uh, ADAM, which is adaptive uh, momentum, uh, are methods which contain some information about the gradients. And uh, uh, coming back to the question online here on in the chat on its try and iterate, uh, the, whole, uh, the whole field of machine learning, since you have multidimensional functions which you want to optimize, then uh, finding a kind of golden recipe, which allows you to spend as few iterations as possible and have a, an error which is acceptable is one of the holy grails of machine learning. And if you think back to that paper, Adam, uh, the adaptive momentum, which uh, includes information about the gradient in the setup of the learning rate as a function of number of iterations, that paper has more than 150,000 citations. 
and that paper was published in 2014. So uh, that simply tells you how important this kind of petit problem, which you see here, when you look at the problem here, it looks like a, uh, how to say, a trifle, right? Why don't I just fit the zeta? But you should extrapolate this to the case with uh, many, many variables. So these examples are main, meant just to show the link between automatic differentiation and the back propagation algorithm. Then in real life applications, we are going to have uh, tons of parameters, which means that uh, it's basically impossible to calculate data. So if we can make some uh, good guesses and or have some intuition about the second derivative or the cost function, that helps a lot. One thing which helps a lot is having uh, proofs or information that the uh, second derivative is positive. In some cases, you have second derivatives which are positive. So that means that uh, uh, you have a convex problem. And that means normally that you have a global minimum. And convex, if you have information that the problem you want to optimize is described by a convex function, that can help you in uh, setting up the uh, estimates for the learning rate. So all these kind of types of informations enter the optimization part. So there is another question is if there is a rule of thumb for what the learning rate should be according to, for example, the number of nodes or layers, there is actually not a rule of thumb. If you have insights about the properties of the functions, that can say something. Now you have a, a, some preconditioning which you can apply to the uh, second derivative which can help you in setting up a guess for the um, for the learning rate. But every iteration will have the updates of the parameters. And that means that, that also their derivatives will change from iteration to iteration. So I s wanted to spend a little bit time here since you came up with these questions, which are very important. The uh, I will also send you a link to my lectures on gradient methods and optimization. We will not cover that now, but you will find ways by which you can tune this learning rate in a better way than just this brute force way in the uh, code examples below. And they link also to uh, the uh, lecture notes on uh, optimization. But I, what I wanted to have you with me is the fact that these uh, optimization problems are really at the heart of all of machine learning. The textbook by Goodfellow et al., if you go to chapter eight, has a very good discussion of the optimization problem. I hope that this long, long digression here uh, gave you uh, an answer to the pro to the some of the questions. So the uh, the extension to the above code by just adding a layer means that we now would have, and now I label the input as A0, and then I have the output from the first hidden layers, A1. So my A0 is X. The uh, I have the same cost function. And in the example below, I'm just training the same input function as we had, just a linear function. I can have uh, the layout of the near neural network. And this is something which we discussed before the break as well. So you have the different parameters here. And the, uh, we are breaking down everything in terms of a computational graph. And every box here is now given by a uh, elemental function. So this is just a cost function. Now in a cost function here, we have the different activation functions, which are normally given by elementary functions. Here now, you see us repeating the same thing. And uh, you see now also that the second derivative, no, the first derivative, or the gradients of the different parameters. Uh, we see this pattern repeated. And uh, in this case here, what we have now is the derivatives activation functions. And you see also then that looking at these derivatives, we get a clear message that if these derivatives vanish, then the training will actually stop. And this is unwanted. Now the cost function is the one which we use to gauge the quality of the results. But in order to have a training which runs properly, 
we need to have uh, gradients which do not vanish because in every iteration we are updating or every back propagation stage we are updating these parameters and you see here now the pattern which i mentioned before the break that we can rewrite uh, parts of this in terms of new parameters delta one so that we are just left with delta one times a zero and this is something uh, which i leave also as a small exercise to generalize to more than one hidden layer so the training then takes place through these equations where the learning rate is just a parameter. And uh, uh, if we look at the code example, which you have here, I've actually made a small change. So now I have rewritten everything so that it can be treated as matrices times matrices or matrices times vectors. But the basic structure is the same. So you see now that uh, in this particular case, the hidden layer has an activation function, which is the sigmoid function, which I have defined up here. And this produces uh, uh, an input in terms of uh, the uh, input X the, from the input layer. I have a W1 here, which is now weight, which I have rewritten either as matrices or vectors. And this is something you can now generalize to later. And then I produce my C2 here, which now can be a vector or a matrix, and which is multiplied with the parameters W2. In this specific example, all the quantities are scalars. And then I have my uh, forward propagation part. This is the back propagation. I get back A1 and A2. I calculate my cost function, which is now my uh, standard uh, root mean squared error or root mean squared error. Uh, this is the delta two parameter. I calculated delta one, but now I have to be a little bit careful with dimensionalities. This is what you have here is the derivative of the sigmoid function, this quantity here. And that defines this quantity delta one, which you see in the equations. And then I can calculate the output weights and the output bias, the gradients of these quantities. And then I can do the same thing with the uh, hidden weights and the hidden biases. So now I have four derivatives, which I then can put back. So in my case now, the network is still very simple, but I have defined X as an array. And this array contains just one element. So my number of inputs is just one. The number of features is just one, which I define to be the uh, uh, type of the input variables. If I have a function which depends on, let's say, X and X and Y as variables, I would have to have two features. And so you could continue like that. And you see, I have only one hidden neuron. So this is just a scalar uh, example where all the quantities are scalars. And I initialize my weights. You can see the weights for the hidden layer and the weights for the output layers. They are just put, in, put to some random numbers. And then I put my learning rate to 0 0.1. You can change this. Ideally, you have to make a loop over different learning rates. You can add hyperparameters, as many of you are familiar with. And this sets up simply the derivatives. And it calls a backpropagation algorithm. And when I run the code, what I'm doing now is simply to spit out uh, for every backpropagation stage. I now spit out the uh, mean squared error. And remember now again that A2 and A1 are just scalar quantities. And if I run this, you see now I start with a pretty large error. So this is not very good. But then after some few iterations, I'm actually down to, after some 40 iterations, I have an error of 10 to the minus eight. So with some very few iterations, you actually have a result which gives you a very small error. Now you can play around with different learning rates here. Uh, so you can retry. So I have just 50 iterations here. The network is a little bit more complicated. And you see that in this case, the error is actually larger. So I would need more iterations if I decrease the learning rate, because if you make a small learning rate, your derivatives or your gradients are barely moving. Then we can include more data. And uh, the challenge then, which uh, we will also discuss a little bit later, is to include automatic derivation because as you see now in these simple codes, 
uh, is that the derivatives of the different quantities are just plugged in by hand. So in this particular case, I would have the derivative of the cost function. Uh, here, I'm calculating the derivative of the activation function for the hidden layer, and everything is plugged in by hand. You know that if you now are going to change the activation function, you would have to change the derivative here. If you're going to change the cost function, you would have to change uh, the expression here, which will be the derivative of the cost function. And remember now that in this case, the output is equal to the input. So that means that its derivative you know, of the derivative A2 with respect to C2 is actually one here. So then uh, uh, there are some extensions and I leave that as small exercises. It's uh, if you haven't done it, if you have done it, if you've written your own code, as many of you have, you can simply just bring that back to life. So to next time, it would be very useful if you have started to look at your neural network code. Uh, eventually, you can actually take what we have here. The uh, uh, next example is the one which I mentioned before the break, where we now have uh, two input nodes. Uh, the example is still that of uh, a case where we have just one value for x0 and one value for x1. You should feel free to take these programs and increase that to, let's say, a thousand input values, x0 and x1. That would give you a thousand output values y here. Now, in this case, there is only one output. So this could also be used for a classification problem where we have a true false case. So if you have a true false case, that means that you would just have one output, either true or false, which you numerically would label as one or zero or one or minus one, it's just a binary case. In that case, the if you use a classification problem of the binary type, then typically you would use the uh, sigmoid function as your activation function. But here we are looking at a classification problem, not a regression type problem. You're fitting a function, so that means that the, the input here from these uh, hidden nodes uh, are actually uh, just producing an output. So the A2 is actually equal to the Z2 value, which we have here. Uh, but now I'm just using a different labeling, as you can see, just in order to prepare the ground for the general case. So the uh, uh, variables now will contain a superscript, which indicates the layer. So the input layer is labeled as layer zero. So these are now my new variables. And the uh, hidden layer has output variables with a superscript one. And my output layer has variables uh, with a superscript two, as you can see here. And the uh, unknown parameters for the hidden layer are given by these four weights, which now connect the two hidden nodes with the uh, two input parameters. And then they have the two bias variable, one for each hidden node. So these are now uh, matrix elements, and these are elements of a vector B. And then uh, the output layer contains now two parameters for the weights. And so the superscript two indicates that this is the output layer. So in total, I'm going to have a cost function which receives this A2 as output. There's only one output. And we can keep this as a scalar, whereas the input is given by a vector with two elements. I have my target value Y, and then I have my set of unknown parameters. And in total, we have nine parameters, which we now need to tune. Now. The, uh, you can write this out in a more compact way so that the different uh, inputs to the first hidden nodes or the hidden layer are given by this matrix times the uh, input vector. So remember now that the superscript zero stands for the input layer. And then we have the two bias values. So this is the more compact way you would set it up. And it represents uh, what we call an affine transformation. When we are going to include more input variables, then this A0 and A1 will transform into a matrix where typically the L, the rows of the matrix could be the input variables. And then the columns could be given by 
the specific features. So these are two specific variables now. And uh, the outputs are now given by this vector here. But keep in mind again that everything here is tailored to just one input variable. When we are training a network, the network training is normally very greedy. And we would like then to uh, have many, many more input variables. So then we can repeat the same exercise. So the output layer contains this input C2 with the information from the uh, output from the hidden layer plus B2 here. I have my final output given by this uh, functional relation. And then we have to backstep ourselves. And this is nothing but just using uh, the backpropagation algorithm and setting all the chain rule, which is a better name. And then with those derivatives, which we have broken down, we can actually implement automatic differentiation, which you will find in the more advanced code example below here. But I'm going through this in order just to set up the general equations, which we then can generalize to a multi-layer neural network. So the derivatives for the output layer are then given by this functional relation here. We have this delta two, which now uh, contains the same set of partial derivatives as before. This is what we've seen before. And the B is simply given by this delta two because DC of DB is just equal to one. So this gives us delta two here. Then we can take the derivatives of the hidden layer. And you can see now that if we go through the calculations, we are now breaking this down in terms of different derivatives. So I'm going to have the same quantity. So this would be my delta two, which you see here. But then I have a DC two, which now depends explicitly DZ zero. And then I'm getting, when I break it down and notice that the Z two variable is given as a function of A zero and one and A one and zero, then we can easily see that this quantity uh, these uh, two partial derivatives are now given in terms of uh, the weight from the uh, output layer times the derivatives of the activation function for the hidden layer times the uh, input uh, to the uh, to that specific layer. Uh, sorry, the output. And then that defines this new quantity in terms of this one. And then I have these derivatives now, which contains this delta zero one of A0. Similarly, if I take the other ones, these are the other derivatives, I get this quantity and you can complete the list and we can make this uh, a more general. So if we collect all the expressions and I hope this kind of exercise of the chain rule is uh, allows you to see how we can soon generalize everything. So this expression can be generalized in a more compact form and if you look at the gradient expressions we want, so for the output layer, where the superscript two is here, then we have these expressions in terms of the subscript i, since we have two output nodes, this would be an a zero and an a one. And similarly for the bias, since we have only one bias, and these guys, the wij's for the hidden layer, are now simply going to be given by this function delta i, and these, they are multiplied by the input variables. And this delta one here is now the parameter for the hidden layer, which is given in terms of these partial derivatives, which are defined above here. And then we have again the learning rate. So these are the four equations which we would have to program for this more general case. Now, I have actually left as a small exercise to extend the above programs. In the programs you saw above, you actually have all the things which are needed for doing the training of a function which now depends on two parameters, x0 and x1, which is now a second order polynomial in x0 and x1. This means that you would set up a uh, input matrix x, which now contains the uh, input variables. So I have uh, n from zero up to n minus one, so the rows now represent the input variables. And then these columns, each column vector is either x0 and x1. So your input matrix would now be a matrix of dimensionality n times two. And this is being multiplied with the weights. So the weights are 
given by a two by two matrix. So you would have an N times two times a two by two matrix. So the affine transformation then would be given by this matrix X times a matrix which contains the weights plus a vector containing the biases. And that would produce your input to the hidden layer. And then this input is modulated through the activation function, which could be a sigmoid function, et cetera, et cetera. So with these examples, we are now ready to actually go back to the full equation. So suppose now that we uh, use the sigmoid function as an uh, activation function for the output layer. So L now, uppercase L, stands for the uh, last layer, the output layer. So when you see this uppercase L, that is the output layer. And now I'm generalizing this. So this is a derivative of the cost function. This is a derivative of the activation function. And this is now the uh, value of the uh, output from the last, second last or the last hidden layer, which is now L minus one. So uppercase L is the output layer, which previously was two. And L minus one is obviously one. That's the hidden layer. So you can now have a series of such hidden layers. And uh, now we are simply assuming that we have many weights uh, for the output layer as well. Uh, if we just have one output, then clearly this function here, or this variable W would just be a uh, one dimensional uh, matrix, which is just a vector. And now you see that uh, these are the quantities which we need to take into account. And then we can define this same quantity Delta J. This is the same quantity we defined before, which now collects the uh, cost function, which in this case can be the mean squared error. And uh, if we now assume that also the hidden, the output layer has a, an, this function, which you see AJL times one minus AJL is the derivative of the sigma function. But in general, what we would have is what you see here. This is the equation which we would have to code in a more general way. And uh, this is normally given by a Hadamard product. And as this is something which is easy to see if you go back to the previous examples, which means that this is can be a vector or a mate, uh, and this can be a vector. And that means that we are just doing component by component. That's what is meant by the Hadamard product. So when you're setting this up in uh, your program, you would not have a matrix multiplication or a, a vector, vector multiplication, but you would simply write the uh, uh, asterisk for the uh, Hadamard operation, which means that you're multiplying element by element. And this is the parameter delta L for the output layer. Then we can uh, continue because now we have found this quantity, which is a function of the activation function, not the, the cost function, the type of cost function we have. Then we have that these parameters now are given in terms of this parameter delta times this value. The uh, parameters B, so if we just continue, we can easily see, and if you go back to the simple examples we have, we see that this parameter is also the same as the cost function uh, and its derivative with respect to the bias variable at the output layer. So uh, that error, it's often called the error or just uh, this uh, collection of derivatives uh, from the chain rule, that's equal to the rate of change of the cost function as a function of the bias variable. And that's also an interesting property because this uh, quantity here uh, or the variable Z depends just on the, uh, on, on the variable B. Then uh, we have now the derivatives and the, this quantity. So these are equations we have to implement. And then we need to back propagate. So what we want then uh, as we saw in the previous examples, we would like to have an expression for these uh, parameters delta for a given layer L. So we replace the uppercase letter L with a general layer L here. And this is uh, one of the quantities we want to set up. And if you go back to what we did previously in the simpler examples, if we just scroll back a little bit, 
you see now that the, these different parameters, which we have this delta one, which was for the hidden layer, is simply given for this simpler case in terms of the one from the output layer times these derivatives here. And what we need to do then is essentially to find that parameter delta because that's going to be the important parameters. And now we are simply using the chain rule here. And you see that we get the parameter delta from the previous layer, the layer ahead. And then we have these derivatives of that function. And we know that this function here is simply given by the weights from the uh, L plus one layer times the outputs from the previous layer times their biases. And again, we can then rewrite this in a compact way because now we need more nodes. So we need uh, to make a sum here. So this parameter delta J is now going to be given by the deltas from the layer ahead, closer to the output layer, times the weights for that specific layer, times the derivative of the cost of the activation function for that specific layer. So if you look at this function, which you have here, this one, and you go back to the simpler example. So this is one of the reasons why I'm spending a little bit more time on this. If you go back to that, what you have is the case in for the scalar type of system or for this system with only two hidden nodes, you have a delta one, which and a delta two here, which we also have defined a delta delta zero. So we have two, one for each hidden node. And you see now you have the weights from the layer ahead, the derivative of the activation function times the delta parameter from the layer ahead. So if you look at this expression here, this is nothing but a special case with two hidden nodes and uh, two input nodes of the expression, which you see here for the general case with many hidden nodes in a given layer L plus one and a given layer L. And J here stands for the specific node. So this is just a generalization of that specific case which we went through. So I hope you see the wood for the trees because these are the basic elements which we need to program. And then uh, when we are setting up the back propagation algorithm, we need to set the input data and the activations of the input layer and then compute the activation function and the pertinent solutions. Then you perform a feed forward till you reach the output layer and you have computed all these Z values so that means that the uh, hidden layers run from one up to uppercase L minus one. And then the output layer is simply uppercase L, which in our simpler cases were just the layer one and layer two. And then when we have performed the feed forward, we need to calculate this delta J for the output layer, which is simply the derivative of the uh, activation function for the output layer. And if we are doing a regression problem, this derivative is just one. And then we have the derivative of the cost function with respect to the output. And then we back propagate. And then we are computing these quantities, these deltas. And when we have these deltas, that's when we can actually set up, there shouldn't be an equality sign here, by the way. We can then set up the uh, final algorithm and update the gradients. So every iteration, we are now simply setting up these equations here where we have these parameters for delta and then we have the output from the previous layer l minus one and similarly for the biases so this is something which we can break down in terms of uh, uh, elementary functions since the activation functions are often given in terms of uh, simple functions whose derivatives also have simple analytical expressions so just keep this in mind when we are training a network, we are looking after functions which can be implemented easily. Uh, functions which have uh, simple elementary uh, expressions for the derivatives, which means that then when we break down everything as a computational graph, we have the possibility to use automatic differentiation. Now, the uh, uh, what I would like you to do now when you... Uh, uh, when we meet next time uh, is actually to take a look at some of the discussions we have here.
on fine tuning neural network parameters, etc. Uh, I'm going to send you a link to the uh, gradient optimization part. This is something which we will not discuss in detail. And uh, uh, I invite you then to, uh, after these all these deliberations here and different types of activation functions, etc. So take some time to read through this. There is also a very nice discussion in chapter 11 and 12 of the Goodfellows text. And uh, when we then uh, have gone through that, uh, I would invite you to uh, take a look at uh, the program which we have here. Then, uh, after we've done uh, with that, I mean, I will also uh, add a uh, video where I go through this program. And this is something which I will not have in the lecture next week, because next week I want to begin with convolutional neural networks. So I'm going to add an additional video on neural networks where I actually discuss the code which you see here. There are also, if you scroll down, implementations of the same. So this is us writing our own code based on these simple examples and generalizing that. And then based on that, uh, we can either use our own code or we can use TensorFlow or PyTorch. And if you scroll down, you will find examples on how to run a calculation with TensorFlow and also how you can do that with PyTorch. And then next week, we will actually start with a, a discussion of convolutional neural networks because convolutional neural networks have also at the heart of their training, the backpropagation algorithm. So what we have done now, even if we spend some time on going through the basic mathematics, this is something which will turn useful because you will see this algorithm being used again and again and again. And as a final word, I hope this demystification where we simply show that the backpropagation algorithm is nothing but the implementation of the chain rule. And if you can express everything as a computational graph, then you can actually use automatic differentiation. And these are topics which I will cover in a separate video, which uh, I will upload a little bit later. And But next week, we will start with the uh, convolutional neural networks.